You are entering an investing state of mind the system doesn't want you in. The truth. You want answers? Michael Covell has them on the trend-following radio network. And now, reaching over 130 countries and territories, Michael Covell. Today on the podcast, I have Tom Basso. Tom, originally profiled in Jack Schwager's The New Market Wizards, ran a very successful trend-following firm for a very long time. Now, as a private investor, he's still a trend-following trader. Tom has appeared on my podcast multiple times and is a fantastic guest. If you don't learn something from Tom Basso, please give up and retire. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Tom Basso. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Just got back from two weeks in French Polynesia and very relaxed. Uh, I'm taking a break from moving five tons of gravel in my yard right now to talk to you, and then I'll go back to that when we're done. The five tons of gravel sounds like good exercise, to say the least. That's the way I view it. Yeah. So French Polynesia, I've not been there, even though I've been in roughly that same part of the world. But that's probably, I'm guessing, if I looked at a map, that's probably another 10 hours from where I've been in Southeast Asia. About, yes. It's in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, just off, kind of down by New Zealand area. It's yeah. pretty far south. And uh, although very, you know, in their summertime right now, so 80s, humid, probably a lot like Vietnam and some other places in the summer. Could you live in a place like that? Not if I had my choices, but yeah, I could live there if I had to. But I I really enjoy Arizona a lot. It has the best of, it seems to me, the mountains and some of the uh, peace and quiet and the beautiful trees. And then it's got the desert down in the valley with Phoenix area where there's a lot of action, lots of concerts and plays and restaurants and things to do. They're only 90 minutes away from each other. So I sort of have the best of both worlds. You know, I have to give you and Jack Schwager and Charles Faulkner all a big shout out because my podcast keeps evolving and changing and I've had a lot of non-trading guests on and some fairly noteworthy. But I think the three of you guys coming on really early and kind of giving me some credibility has really helped to expand things out. So I'm, I'm most appreciative for you sticking with me, Tom. <laughs> I always have fun talking to you. Uh, I, I spend zero time preparing for it, and it's just a, it's just a hole in my schedule, and it's always fun. Listen, here's where I want to go. I thought there was something fairly topical we could talk about. I don't know how you want to set it up or how we should play with it, but I've seen in the headlines there's been some hedge funds that have had not the greatest returns this year, and a lot of people are bemoaning the price of oil, which is kind of funny. You would think oil drops, everyone should be happy, but apparently there's so many budgets and programs and social programs tied to high oil around the world, and so a lot of people aren't happy, but hey, this is a zero-sum game, so quite a few people that in our little world are happy that oil has dropped, but I think what's so interesting is how many people, and I haven't tried to Google this, but how many people... You know, five, six, seven months ago, we're, we're talking about a 50% crater in oil. Uh, you just, nobody was predicting this at all. But then there's one trading strategy that seemed to do exceptionally well during this unpredictable run, huh? Yeah, trend following. You know, all you have to do is uh, short it someplace up around 100 or 90 and, and enjoy the ride. Yeah, but you, you make it sound so simple. I mean, there's, it, it, there's some very, I, I saw the head of OPEC and he, he said, well, all the speculators are doing this. And hold on. At what price are the speculators not involved in oil? They're, they're involved at every single price. The reason the speculators are in there <clears throat> helps to create a price without the speculators there and the constant buying and selling. You wouldn't know where the price of oil is from second to second. Uh, you might know where it was from maybe day to day or maybe even hour to hour as big, large companies and large hedgers and things uh, made a transaction. But the market would be very inefficient. It would jump all over the place. With speculators there, you have uh, every second trades going off and you know exactly where the price of oil is second by second. And Tom, I know you personally don't ponder these things so much because you 
you've been there, done that, you understand it deep in your gut. But when you, you hear a headline where the, the head of OPEC is saying that the, the price is where it should not be, the fundamentals do not support this price and, and cast blame at speculators for this particular point of price. Explain to the audience just how disingenuous that is. Well, it's disingenuous because the price of anything is where someone will buy and sell it to each other at. If a speculator would be selling it and driving the price down, someone else has to be buying it to make that transaction happen. And for that person to be buying it, that could also be a speculator. So, well, wait a second, how can speculators be driving it down if speculators are on both sides of that trade? Or it could have been a hedger, like uh, let's say Southwest Airlines uh, in the past has come in and bought gas when they thought it was cheap, and maybe they're thinking that now, so maybe the speculator is selling it to Southwest Air, and they're hedging their future uh, fuel costs. All right, fine. Well, then it goes down cheaper. Well, Southwest can buy some more future cheap oil. I don't see... You know, nobody ever complains uh, like OPEC when the prices go skyrocketing up to 100 and something, but the same speculators are there at that point in time as they are right now. It doesn't like speculators don't just short the market, they, they go both ways. And so it's, it's just very, um, it's for public relations. It's trying to place blame. It's trying to placate their people because Saudi Arabia depends so much as does Norway and uh, there's a trend, yeah, Norway, I think it is. That some of the socialistic type of programs out there in the countries that depend on oil. I think Brazil, to some extent, Venezuela, all countries that are leaning towards liberal socialist types of things and using oil revenues to try to help pay for them. Well, now they don't have those revenues anymore. It's at a level that they used to. So you know, they try to place blame, try to you know not point the finger at themselves for setting up a budget that was based on the house of cards but you know that's the way the world works these days it seems yeah you know so i just was in dubai thursday friday saturday and so when you talk about when the price of oil is high no one complains well i know why they're not complaining because i just saw what they've been building with that oil money over there and it's fa- <laughs> it's i mean frankly it's fabulous they've done a fabulous job building out a city i don't know if it's where i'd want to live but i i, I right. really they've done a hell of a job i've seen uh, the photos on your facebook page uh, very impressive yeah they've done a hell of a job hey let me jump into something really basic and i was since we've talked a bunch of times i I've, the real challenge in speaking with you is because to try and not let you get the feeling of being bored. So, like, how do I how, how do I make sure that I'm giving you something somewhat fresh? Very difficult to do. Very difficult to do. But listen, let's talk about your stomach lining for a second and just go back and just I, – I think this is a good reminder for whether it's the professional out there, the new trader, the new investor – and talk about Tom Basso's stomach lining. And, and if you don't mind also the rush and the devastation, you know, we have that we can have this emotional rush. Oh my gosh, I'm making so much money and I'm losing money, the devastation. But talk about your own stomach lining, Tom. Let's just talk about that, that lining. Well, first of all, my stomach lining seems to be doing just fine as far as I can tell. I have never had any ulcers or anything else. A knock on wood, I guess. In my early trading years, which was well reported in Schwager's uh, New Market Wizards chapter on me, uh, there were some silver trades that went all over the place. That really was catching my attention uh, almost hour by hour. It was pretty much, it was during the hunt, uh, cornering uh, the silver market type episode there. And that was more excitement than I really needed. And I tried to analyze why was I so uncomfortable and how do I stay true to trend following while at the same time dealing with the issue that I've got a position that I want to let my profits run, cut my losses short. But the position that I have now is moving all over the place by tens of thousands a day on an account that just a few months ago was maybe 50000 or or 100000 or something like that. Now it's worth... 400,000 or 500,000 and it's moving up and down tens of thousands a day. That kind of opens your eye a lot and uh, I realized out of that that there's no reason you can't stay true to trend following and stay with the position. You just need to manage the position size. So all I did was figure out ways to volatility adjust and to risk adjust my positions ongoing 
throughout the trade so that things would become fairly tame and and the stomach lining would be kept very intact there was nothing to get excited about because one day was roughly the same as every other day and that's that's what i learned out of the early trading mistakes and and situations where they really would have gotten to my stomach lining over my lifetime and once we got to trend step days we just automated a lot of that but to the point where you know it, it just happened automatically and the only thing that would affect my stomach lining at that point would be a power outage or you know the internet lines go down or uh, you know the program's not working properly or something like that but uh, certainly wasn't the markets anymore you know i've seen in many interviews that you've had and going back to our conversations, you've talked about how you would mentally rehearse catastrophic events. And I guess if you've got a position on and it's the wrong kind of position, if you're long and you don't adjust and oil drops 50%, that's a catastrophic event. And I, I saw a great comment from Van Tharp and he talked about that he got a phone call from you once and and you said that you had a disaster the prior day and you you couldn't answer the phone, you couldn't talk to Van but basically you said it was a planned disaster. So you've been thinking about, as even a young man, is like, how do I plan for catastrophic events? How do I plan for the unexpected? Because it's going to happen. Right, exactly. And I, I was amazed at how many uh, CTAs, professional traders, did not plan for disasters. We would, once a year at least, have a, what I would call a disaster day. And I would tell everybody ahead of time, so everybody in the company knew what to expect, and I asked a little bit extra out of everybody. And uh, we moved a section of the company to our off-site location to operate in an alternative mode and try to run the company from the secondary location, while a certain number of people stayed in the primary location to answer phone calls from clients and things that would come in that would be normal routine business, and we didn't want to have our disaster day exercise affecting, you know, the clients being able to get to, you know, to us uh, and, and schedule appointments or talk to us or something. With Van's call, for instance, that wasn't a, a huge, hugely necessary, I absolutely, I got to do this right today call. So I put him off because I was trying to make sure we did this exercise. And uh, it required a whole lot of attention because when you're operating on backup equipment, it's, it's a little bit more clunky than it would be with your mainstream stuff. So, but what we did all day was we started and we, we offloaded data to the backup facility. We put orders in from the backup facility. We tried to call our trading desk from the backup facility. We tried to, you know, look at procedures and things and modify things. Uh, so did we have all the word files and Excel spreadsheets and different things that we needed to operate. And invariably, what you get out of those exercises is a, is, a, is a good list of things that you missed or that have changed since last time you did a disaster backup, and uh, you can improve and tighten your operations. I find it amazing to me that some CTAs just have a single operation and they don't have a clue what would happen if, uh, say, the mobile phones went down or if, uh, you know, the internet goes down, you know, you lose electricity one of your trading desks is no longer available for some reason. There's so many different scenarios, but if you've actually gone through some of them and actually tried to tell your trading partners what you're doing, uh, I always found that they were very, very, very excited in working with me to generate ways of operating in an emergency because they, they have the same problem on their side. They want to know that I'm going to be able to deal with what happens to me I and mean, in some of these cases they were giving us money to trade so we were trying to uh, you know be good partners and I think that's something that you can do in a lot of aspects of life uh, it's amazing how many people just kind of let life put it to them and then there's the stress of dealing with it as opposed to trying to say well I could go this way and those following two or three things could happen or it might not happen and it might be this and if it is, you know, do I go to plan B or do I try to solve that problem? There's a lot of things you can do if you think ahead a little bit, do a little planning, do a little exercising, and then it's not so stressful when it happens. Those catastrophic events, though, it's not necessarily only what you've just described. Thinking in terms of catastrophic events is also about your portfolio, your trading strategy. Sure, it is. And so to some extent, you know, the, the, probably the most catastrophic move that I ever saw was when we invaded um, Iraq during HW. 
uh, when we went from Kuwait into Iraq. Those years, when I was let's see, closing down the markets, I think the oil was at thirty-two dollars a barrel. We were long. By eight o'clock that night, we had had a bit of a computer issue at, at the Trendstat, and I was staying late that night. I left uh, having solved the problem at about eight p.m., which would have been well, you know, six hours or more after the close. And oil was up to forty dollars a barrel, and we were rolling into Iraq. So I thought, oh, this is ought to be pretty nice. And I go to sleep, and I come in the next day, and oil is at twenty-two dollars a barrel, and we're you know we're stopped out and take a chunk of a loss. I think we lost in all the portfolios about five or six percent of the whole portfolio that day, which was to that day and to this day the largest single day loss that I saw. Uh, in uh, trading the futures markets. So, I mean, and we made it back and we were at new highs a month or two later, three months later. Uh, it wasn't a big deal, but it was, it was wow, <laughs> 6% in one day. That's interesting. It wasn't something that was unusual because, uh, yeah, we, we saw what the markets did. It was a bad day, but you can recover from a 6% loss. It's not going to hurt you. And we had managed that position properly. It had gotten very volatile, so we were down to minimum size positions. When it got down to 22, a lot of accounts couldn't even own a position because the volatility was too great. So we would keep them out of the position altogether. You know, life was good, and we, like I said, came back to new highs shortly thereafter. It sounds so simple, but I think for most people, that simple story can go right over their head. And, and the big picture point there is that you're saying, hey, look, We've got to have chips to play the game. Our egos are not so big that we know what's going to happen next. So if the market's not going our way, let's take our losses, get out, and come back to play another day. Exactly right. That's all it is. It's a. It's how do you get to your next one thousand or two thousand or ten thousand trades? It's all a matter of statistics. Uh, any one trade can either win or lose. Uh, over time, I usually figured that we were around thirty three percent profitable and about 67 percent of the time unprofitable on trades and uh, of course the, the winners were worth a lot more than the losers were so it worked out but yeah you got to come back and do those next 2000 so that you can get the 33 percent that are profitable and have to deal with the 67 that aren't and every piece of media and of course media is not relevant to trend following trading but if you if you look at media all media whether it's print, uh, radio, online, TV, is all about the trade for that day, the trade for that day. And there you just calmly and coolly say, hey, hold on. I don't care about one trade. I care about a thousand trades into the future. That's what I want to be focused on. There's something that Van Tharp had said a long time ago, uh, and I remember it so well, is a good day for a trader is following your strategy. In other words, trying to get to those next 1,000 trades and just doing what you do over and over again. It's not whether you made money or lost money today. It's whether you followed your strategy today and put on that next set of trades that you're supposed to have put on according to your strategy. And when you get into that mode, then trading gets a little less exciting. Your stomach lining feels a lot better and you'll have more success. You've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years. I think anyone that's that's been online has seen this. Is that you quite enjoy interacting with people, and you're on Twitter, and you're on Facebook, and you weren't doing this a couple of years ago, but now you do. And I I know you've you've given a lot of interviews, and you've stayed connected with people, and you clearly really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I I do think though what's interesting is that you have a definite political opinion. And I'm not necessarily curious about the political opinion. I know what it is, and I share a lot of those beliefs. But I think for some people, they could see the political opinions and get confused. They could say, well, well, Tom's got this strong opinion, on that. and they could somehow or another think your trading is living and breathing with your political opinion, and, and it's not. Oh, not at all. Uh, my political opinion... Is that, you know, I think just like trading, where traders have to take self-responsibility uh, to be successful. If, you, if you're blaming the, the guys on the floor for screwing you on the trade, or if you're blaming your broker for giving you the wrong advice or whatever, you're going to fail. you got to take self-responsibility. You have to be responsible for finally for you uh, pulling the trigger on something. And I think that's what I fail to see a lot throughout political life as well. There's a lot of finger-pointing all the time. Something happens, and... 
you know, so and so is blaming Congress, and so and Congress is blaming the president, and you know, everybody's blaming everybody else. And I think they're not looking to themselves and saying, what could they have done? You see these parties involved to make that not happen or happen better or whatever. And I think trading is the same way. And so I, I, I view a lot of my political views come from that same bent, but it's certainly not, it, have, it doesn't have anything to do with my trading. My trading is just purely mathematical and uh, if the direction's up, I want to be long. If it's down, I want to be short. It's not any more complicated than that. You know, I've had some I've had some traders on here this fall, current CTAs uh, running multi billion dollar funds. Really interesting people to talk to, mm-hmm. and I'll get feedback. And they'll they'll come on the show and they'll say, "Hey, we're price driven. We're one hundred percent systematic. This is what we do." And I'll get these emails from people that they're like, "No, you don't get it, Covell. There's a there's a secret fundamental overlay. There's discretion going on in the back room." And I'm just, it still strikes me as funny as it's so many trend following traders just like you will come out and say, "This is exactly what we do." Yeah. There is no fundamental input, and people still think, no, there's a secret sauce of human discretion that you don't know about, Mike, and, and you're missing the point, and you don't realize that Basso's really got a huge fundamental staff in the back room. <laughs> I don't have time. i got to move the five tons of gravel this afternoon. No, you know, I think it comes down to people love to have complicated things. A lot of traders, when they start out, what do they do? They go get uh, Covell's book. You get... You know, Schwager's stuff, you get all sorts, you read, 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 you get a lot of opinions about all sorts of different ways of trading, fundamental and technical, and there's a pattern in the universe type stuff like Elliott Wave and, and Fibonacci and all that stuff, and you you just, the poor trader starting out just looks at all this and just can't figure out what to do next, and the human mind wants to make something as important as making money in the markets, a very complicated thing. Like Tom's been around for a lot of years, so that's why he's so experienced and that's why he's successful. But the reality of it is, you know, simple things work the best. It, Schwager had a way of saying it, it was degrees of freedom. In other words, the more th- things you add to a strategy, you start out with a simple moving average, then you say, I'll only do the buy signal in the moving average if the, if the, if the moon is in the right phase. And then you, and then you add on that, that you gotta have it only on the open and not any other time during the day. And it's gotta meet those criteria. And you start adding filter after filter after filter. And pretty soon you won't do a trade. You'll sit there and look at all this stuff and you'll first of all be confused because you won't be able to process all that information in your poor brain. And then you'll miss out on trades because you just can't function. There's so much complicated nature. So you sit there and watch the markets and wish that you could trade, you know, and make some money. And really, simple things are very robust. They will, there's very little about them that can fail because it's so simple. There's not anything but price. Price feeds your profits and it feeds your losses. So if you stay to price with all your strategies, you are uh, strategizing on that variable that feeds directly, one-to-one, your profits and losses. So you never get out of sync. If you're, if you're over there looking at interest rates and trying to predict stock market indices, you've got two different variables going on there. The interest rates may agree with the stock market. They may not agree with the stock market. You could get caught sideways someplace. But if you're looking at stock indexes prices and you're buying and selling stock indices, it's one to one. You know, you're going to make money or, or lose money on what stock indices do. And therefore, you never get out of whack. You're always in sync with the market. And you don't have to stress out of it. You know, Tom, you mentioned traders and overwhelming amounts of information and confusion and different strategies. And you mentioned like Elliott Wave and whatnot. One of the things that I found really useful in wrapping my arms around strategies when I was just a new guy trying to understand as well was not to necessarily just trust what Tom Basso has to say, but I would look at the performance data and I could not for all the strategies out there in the quote technical space, I couldn't find any strategy that had this massive number of participants openly putting their performance data out 
each month where you could compare those performance data and see that there was often some correlation, maybe not exact, but there was some correlation. And you could wrap your arms and say, oh, wow, trend following has all these participants. They seem to be doing something similar. I feel comfortable about this. This is a useful piece of information for me. Whereas I've never been able to find that kind of overwhelming amount of data for any other technical strategy. It's only trend following. That's correct. And you'll find that the trend followers also tend to lose money at the same time. And I did studies on if you took the average volatility, high, low range of of various commodity markets over a month time, and then looked at the performance of CTAs in general over that same month, you would find a direct correlation to highly volatile months led to larger CTA profits and lower volatility months led to smaller CTA profits or even losses. And so it made a lot of sense to me that if people are really trend following, you want the market to go a long way. If it's sitting there in one place, you're not going to, you can't make any money if the prices aren't moving. So it was a simple, a simple study and a simple result. And it, and it fed exactly the way it leaned exactly the way that I wanted, that I thought it would lean. That was published someplace a long time ago. It makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if the prices move, then trend followers can make some money. I'm just amazed that so many traders will believe in some type of a strategy and they can't find other market participants actually using this. So they, they, they decide on their lonesome. I have this one novel strategy and they must think in their own mind, well, it's worth more to me because I'm the only one doing it. Whereas I'm like, hold on. I want to see that some other smart people before me have done this. Well, that'd be nice, but so I, I, I can't say that trend following is the only way that you could possibly make money in the markets, but this certainly is one that has been tried and tested by a lot of different you know, minds over the years. And you've got to say that it's certainly a, a sound way to approach things and to keep yourself from getting in harm's way too awfully much. Hey, let me. I'm gonna have a couple more questions on you. I let you go move some gravel around. That that's that. that <laughs> no, I mean, I'm 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 off to yoga after. Well, while you're doing gravel, I'm gonna do yoga. So okay. <laughs> uh, we'll see who sweats more. <laughs> hey, you, years ago, your firm did a study, and people can still find it online. And I think there's some big picture points to it that still are relevant to this day, which is the hot hand type issue, and specifically for people that put money with trading managers. And they often want to put the money with the manager, and specifically, let's talk about trend following traders, but they want to put the money with the manager when they've had this great run. And, and they, every, and it's just the, it's the human condition, behavioral economics, behavioral finance. Now I want to give the money. Whereas, I think in your study, why don't you explain what you found out? It's a little bit different than what people think. Well, what I found out was that the two studies together, the, the prices move, therefore trend followers make money. So trend followers making money means their equity curve gets better and better. So the trends persist for maybe several months. Maybe the you know trend followers are now knocking it out of the park. So then all the money in the world starts rushing in and floods in there. And then the markets start stalling out of those trends. Trend followers go into a sideways or a drawdown. And then at the bottom of the drawdown, at the uh, the pit of you know the, the the trough of the equity curve at the low of the drawdown the markets are now going sideways and are about to break out up or down or whatever but they're just building pressure waiting for it to explode and that's when people are pulling money out just before the next big surge and so uh, what i found is that when you took the dollar weighted return which is the actual the returns that the ctas would have provided had you just put your money with them and left it alone versus the, excuse me, the time-weighted return. I got that wrong. The time-weighted return was what the CTAs will do if you just left it alone. The dollar-weighted return takes into account clients giving the CTAs money at certain times and taking it out at other times. The time-weighted return, which is the CTAs' actual returns by their strategy, were always better than the dollar weighted returns of what the clients did in terms of coming in and going out. So clients were actually hurting their performance across the entire industry. And I forget whether it was 100% of the cases or some very high percent. It was at least 75%. I can't remember the exact study results now, but it was a huge, overwhelming 
preponderance and certainly averaged over the whole industry, it was definitely hurting to have clients put their money in or take money out. They were hurting themselves. What I find so interesting, and we might have even spoken about this before, is that so many aspects of successful trend-following trading have the understanding of behavioral economics, behavioral finance, and how to deal with biases and using heuristics to trade long before it was a popular subject, long before the Nobel Prizes were handed out. There's this group of traders that were essentially, while not promoting the idea that, hey, we understand behavioral economics, were effectively trading in a way where clearly they understood what all the academic research that was to follow in the decades to come. Mm-hmm. The turtles. Every, I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean, all, many of your peers. Yeah. I mean, it was just, is fascinating, you know? Well, yeah, all I'm doing is saying, you know, if the crude oil market's going down, it's not up to Tom to figure out how or why it's going down. It's simply going down. It is. And, uh, and what would you want to be positioned today if you had your choice? Would you rather be positioned in enjoying the downslide or would you be trying to jump in and saying low is low and maybe it's going up from here? I, you know, to me, if the trend is down, I just want to be short. And when it turns around, goes the other way, I want to be long. I don't really want to think too much about it. I've got other things I'd rather think about. And uh, I think that that's reacting to the behavior of a whole bunch of, a whole market full of traders that may or may not be using fundamentals or hedge techniques or whatever they're using to make their decisions, but the aggregate all feeds into that price, it makes it go up, makes it go down. So it's the, it's the dependent variable of all that behavior decision-making of all of those rest of the market, and I'm just reading it in the price and going with it and not thinking too much more than that about it. You know what I love that you just said is I've got, and we can kind of go this direction with the rest of our conversation. I think it's some of the most important stuff. It's very personal. I got other things I would rather think about. And I think what that really says is to people that are paying close attention, hey, my name's Tom. I have this system. I've done the homework. I've done the research. I know why it works. I'm comfortable with it. And then once it's in place and I I put my machine in place, I'm not running around like a a chicken with his head cut off, you know, all nervous and antsy all day long. And as you said, I got other things I'd want to do. And I think what that really says, though, too, is that life is short and you've got to find ways to enjoy your time and have fun. But the idea of of sitting around and staring at a screen and talking trading all the time, trading is just it's a useful byproduct of a process of a machine. But I, you know, I could tell you don't really care. It's not what you are. It's something you know how to do, but it doesn't define you. Yeah, I mean, I, I know how to golf, but I don't consider myself necessarily a one-dimensional golfer, and I don't live and die, you know, about whether I can get to the golf course. I haven't touched my golf clubs thanks to the cruise to Tahiti. Uh, I haven't touched them in about three and a half weeks now, and I'm still enjoying life. I, you know, it's not like I need to get over there and hit balls right after we get off the phone. I think a lot of people get into trading and they they get addicted to the almost the gambling nature of it all. To me, it's just managing my portfolio. The less time I can take to do it, the more time I have to move gravel or talk to you or prune my backyard or, you know, go hit golf balls. There's lots of things or, or take a cruise to Tahiti. A lot of people won't take vacations because they're afraid they're going to miss something in the markets. I just take along my computer and I go do about 10, 20 minutes a day on the ship's uh, satellite internet and I'm done. That's not too burdensome. You know, what you just said there, I think is so terribly important. So many people run their lives afraid they will miss something. And I think that is what's happened in modern society is especially with the media coverage. It's all built around a, a really intense fear Mm -hmm. yeah and i think they're going to miss something so if they're making decisions based on what did the fed decide today then they're glued to the screens trying to you know wait till what the fed decision is coming out i've got to stop sitting there if the fed decision causes the market to go through my stop then i get executed i find out about it when i close the markets down in the afternoon which i'll probably do after our call it's not something i'm going to sit here and want to you know wait until the fed decides to publish their darn report that means i'm sitting here all day long in front of a computer that 
That's not quality of life. But Tom, can't, but can't you listen to the Fed and, and use some extra discretion to improve your trend following performance? No, I cannot. <laughs> I cannot. So I just don't. I, I did enough studies that in the early years that talked about what value did my discretionary decision making make, you know, overlaying it on trend following or anything. And I became clearly convinced that I was not adding any value. So that, therefore, why? I just fired myself, basically. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, you know, I think it's so fun talking to you is because you just are so, you're so clean, meticulous and precise about, about your thinking, about your process, your system, your machine. And I just know some people will listen and they're just going to go, oh, Tom doesn't know that we can improve what he's doing. It can get better. Almost like the $6 million man. We can, we get better, faster, (laughs) stronger. Well, that might be, but uh, you got to remember, I'm 62 and retired and enjoying life, so I don't want to, you know, create a job out of this. Certainly, there's things I could do to try to improve what I'm doing. I'm sure I, if I had a team of computer programs like I did back in the old days at Trendstat, I I probably have a couple of ideas I could work on. But you know, it's just not worth spending that kind of money and effort, and then trying to pick up a few extra percent here and there. It's just not what I do today. So I keep it simple and I, I keep it low fixed overhead and uh, I have zero regulation fees at this point. I have very little to no chance of somebody suing me like I did in the old days. You end up with a low liability, easy to run retirement type of investment strategy and that fits my situation and my dollars and my expertise level and, and that's what every trader should always get to is examine themselves and their capital and their expertise, design the strategy around those things, not around what Tom Bossa does or Michael Covell does or anybody else. Everybody out there needs to do what they need to do for themselves. That's what creates the success because then they can, they can do it over and over again with ease. If you're trying to copy somebody else, you're just, you're not going to ever be at ease with that. You're, you're always going to be trying to compare yourself to that person or try to do things that are not in your expertise levels or maybe you don't have enough capital for or who knows. But if you design what you're doing for yourself, then that's where success lies. We kind of talked about this last time a little. I can I get emails from young people all the time and they want advice on where can I go to get hired in the CTA space, the trend following space? Who will hire me? What What insight can you give me? And I think stories like the turtle story, for example, has really created, and now that since the story is so well known, people think, well, this is going to be, I can, I can recreate this. I can replicate this. I, if I can just get my toe in the door. Whereas I, I think you have some different perspectives about the managed money space today. Why don't you talk about that and maybe offer some advice to a young person today that wants to trade and maybe give an alternate view on ways to go about it versus the ways that people have seen in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Maybe you might have a point that things have changed from your perspective and maybe there's another way to go about it. Yes, clearly, if you took today's world and you took Tom, personally me, I could not do today what I ended up doing back in the 70s and 80s, starting up Trendstat and becoming successful doing all that. I don't think that would be a reasonable path to success in today's world. There's too many billion-dollar money managers with extensive staffs. I have no idea what their criteria is to hire somebody, but I would dare say it'd be hard to get on with a lot of those folks, I imagine. And I think because of the regulation increasing, the cost of doing business increasing in the CTA space, an easier approach to learning how to trade is to probably become your own trader and continue to work very hard at whatever it is that you did before trading, you know, your main job, so to speak. I I was a chemical engineer in the old days, so work hard at chemical engineering, let's say. Save as much money as you can. Keep building your portfolio bigger and bigger and keep building your expertise in trading bigger and bigger. At some point, you'll be making enough money to uh, look at your trading success and say, you know, I'm making as much money off of trading as I am being a chemical engineer. Maybe I don't need to be a chemical engineer anymore. And then you transition, and then you're where I am right now, trading full-time. I think 
the, tr the CTA space has gotten to be very difficult to break into. And I'm really at a loss at this point, partly because I've been out of the business for 11 years, but also just because I, I can't quite see my way clear of how would you go about doing that? That's, you definitely would need uh, capital infusions or partners that would be able to bring in sizable amounts of assets to trade, be able to finance a staff of five or ten at least, lots of you know the phone systems, the computers, the regulatory environment, all the prospectuses, and some of those prospectuses you can blow fifty, hundred thousand dollars really quickly uh, with legal expense. So audits. I mean, CPA fees, it's, it's getting to be a pretty tough game to just break into for a, a little guy operating out of the garage. But that doesn't take away from the fact that if you want to trade, trade your money or friends and family or something to that effect, that opportunity is wide open. You're, you're not saying trading is tougher to break into. You're saying what we've all read about, it, it, the managed money is tougher. The managed money is very tough today. And the, the business of being a CTA it's tough. Trading your own money is free of regulation. It's very low overhead. The commissions now, where in the old days, having being a manager, you could negotiate your commissions and the retail public had to pay a higher brokerage fee. Now everybody pays those brokerage fees. So there's almost no cost to trading these days. And you really can, as a small operator, do things that the big guys almost can't do. I never used to trade orange juice a whole lot when I was at Trinstat, but I trade it now. Because I can, <laughs> I'm, I'm small. I'm a small dollar size compared to what I used to be, so I don't have to worry about it. I can go into markets that I did, didn't didn't go into before very much, and so I think there's you have to examine as an individual trader. Do you want to go and work at a CTA because you're trying to pick up expertise? Well, what if their expertise is is bad? Maybe. I mean, I remember in the day, uh, John Henry was one of the big guys. Say you got a job at John Henry. Well, he was going up and down with 40% drawdowns. Yeah, he traded billions of dollars. I don't think what he was doing made a super amount of sense to me. I thought it was probably always going to lead to very large drawdowns and run-ups because he was more leveraged. And maybe if you go work for somebody like that, he's teaching you that type of stuff. You're learning bad habits, maybe. So there's, it's not a panacea to go to work for somebody else and learn what they're doing. I think it's better for you to learn how to do it on your own and trade your own stuff successfully. And then, then you're right where you need to be. You just need to try to find ways of getting more capital to trade. And that means working harder, taking a second job, doing, getting a, maybe a degree to get a promotion, uh, you know, getting that next rung up on the ladder in the corporate world so that you can have more money to put away. Tom, great wisdom, great wisdom. I, I really like the way how you just lay that out, the, the lack of a panacea. I think a lot of people, they dream and they fantasize about the panacea, but there isn't one. No, there isn't. Becoming a trader to, to get to where I am right now where I'm trading my own account, living off of it, that is something that is difficult enough to get to no matter where you're no matter where you're starting from, unless you're starting from like a major inheritance, you've got all the money in the world, you know, that would be an easier time transitioning. But if you're starting from where I started as a guy out of college with a $4,000 student loan and a chemical engineering job in zero net worth, uh, or negative net worth, actually, I think you, you have to realize that uh, it's a tough road no matter which way you go. Tom, I'm thinking the best place to send people to check you out, uh, to maybe connect with you, Basso underscore Tom, which is your Twitter handle. Is that the best place? Probably f Facebook I look at more. Uh, I put stuff out on Twitter because then it's attached to Facebook and it goes to both places. Uh, but those are usually my market directional calls. Uh, I try to do that to just keep my friends and family informed of which way I'm leaning. And it is what it is. Uh, I noticed I was, what, two, three days late when I was down in Tahiti on the cruise because of the bad bandwidth. So I had gotten a, a cell come in, and then I got whipsawed on it because it made new highs again. Apologize for people who are trying to follow that, but I recommend you don't follow it. Use it for what it's worth, but it's, it's free and possibly worth about that much. <laughs> And I think that uh, you have to do your own thing and, and create your own indicators. But find me on Facebook is probably the easiest way. I'm going to see that probably quicker. 
Uh, I also Tom at trendstop.com. My email address uh, is fine. Send me an email. I just had one today from someone who uh, had some questions and I answered them uh, inside of about six hours. So, Yeah, I do know a lot of people have responded to me and said, hey, Tom's given some great feedback. However, I, I want to tell my audience out there, for those of you that are crazy, it would make me look bad. If you are crazy, please don't contact Tom. <laughs> if, you, if you really are, if you're not connected to reality and you're going to, and you're going to ask really, really weird questions, please don't go there because it'll make me look bad and Tom uh, won't come talk to me anymore. No, no, no. I, I love talking to you, Michael. No, it's okay. And I can, if somebody's crazy, I can figure that out pretty quickly myself. Well, hopefully we can catch up again in 2015. Life's good. Uh, take care of yourself, Michael. It's good talking to you. What's the best way that you can support this broadcast? Go to iTunes and write a review. And for your time, I will send you a CD and DVD of Trend Following Extras. Simply write a review on iTunes and send me an email. Info, I-N-F-O, at trendfollowing.com. Include your address and we will send the CD and DVD. Also, for those of you entering the trend-following trading world, my flagship trading product, including systems and training and full support, can be found at trendfollowing.com. This may be exactly what you need to take your trading to the next level. Once again, thank you for all of your continued support. And my one big pearl of wisdom, do it yourself. Don't trust the system.